Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In previous videos, we considered uh, limits from a graphical standpoint. That is to say that the function f of x was described by a graph, not by a formula. In this video, we'll start considering limits from an analytical standpoint. That is to say the function f of x will be described by a formula, not by a graph. The tools that we'll use will be facts about limits. Uh, this theorem 2, properties of limits, which actually has eight parts. And then theorem 3, about limits of polynomial and rational functions, and theorem 4, uh, about limits uh, of a quotient. Um, so we will do three examples that use these theorems 2, 3, and 4. In the first example, we will let f of x be this polynomial function. Question A is to find f parentheses negative 2. Remember that's spoken f of negative 2, and that is just computing a y value. So the result is that f of negative 2 equals negative 79. A couple of things to notice in this example that we just did. The, the computation is not hard. It's, a, it's something from the prerequisite courses, but it can be tricky. Notice that I took the approach of putting the x in parentheses so that it's very clear um, the order of operations. The exponent gets done first, so the negative 2 gets squared to give us 4 plus 4, and then the negative 7 gets attached to give us a final result of negative 28. In question B, we're asked to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. I start by writing that expression down, and then I write an equal sign, and I simply write the same thing again, but replacing f of x with the polynomial formula that describes f of x. So notice I don't just simply park a single limit in front of this whole expression here. I didn't just put a single limit to the left of that whole thing. Instead, I have limit in front of the symbol f of x, and I have limit in front of the formula for f of x. All right, now how do we compute this limit? Well, um, notice that this function here is a polynomial. If we go back up and look at the limit properties, you will see in theorem 3, if your function is a polynomial function, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. In other words, I can just substitute in x equals negative 2. So when I do that, the result looks like this. And the steps are just like the steps in the previous uh, part A. So notice, uh, again, we had this expression. We had a limit expression, limit of a polynomial. So that expression looks like the left side of theorem 3, limit of some expression that's a polynomial. And then we replaced that whole expression with this whole expression. And that whole expression is what's shown here on the right side of theorem 3. It is uh, a polynomial with a number substituted into it. So that's how we use these limit properties. And um, notice that I, I cite which property I used. All right, now let's go on and do another example. In this example, f of x is this expression involving a square root. Our first assignment is to find f of 5. So that's uh, found by just simply substituting in x equals 5. Notice a couple of things. Again, when I substitute in for a, a x, I always put the thing that I've substituted in in parentheses to make it clear that I've made a substitution. All right, 
Uh, and what we've just computed is a y value. We've computed a y value on the graph of f of x uh, at x equals 5. So when x is 5, y is 7. All right, question b, we're supposed to find the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x. So as we did in the previous part, I start by writing that limit expression down as the left side. And then I write equals, and I write the same limit symbol down, but this time substitute in the formula for f of x. Now, how do we proceed from here? Well, if you go back up to the limit properties, you'll see a limit property, property number 8 in theorem 2, that says basically if you have a limit um, of an expression that's inside of a square root, and the limit symbol is sitting outside of the, the root symbol, you can move the limit inside the, the root symbol as long as all of this stuff is defined. Uh, so um, as long as the thing inside is going to turn out to be positive, because remember that we can't take, or as long as the thing inside is going to turn out to be non-negative, because remember we cannot take the square root of something negative. So let's do that. Let's use theorem 2, property 8. So there's the new expression, and we, we explain how we did this. So I got from that step to the next step using theorem 2.8. So again, um, what I did was I replaced an expression where there was a limit outside of a root symbol with a new expression where the limit has been moved inside of the root symbol. Now, where do we go from here? Well, um, notice that what we've got now is uh, a limit of a polynomial. So remember that theorem 3 says uh, the limit of a polynomial can be found by just simply substituting in the x value. So let's do that here. Start by copying down the stuff that doesn't change. Copy down the square root symbol. And then we write that polynomial with the x replaced with the number 5. And again, I uh, put the, the number 5 in parentheses to indicate that I've made the substitution. And we should explain how we did this step. All right, then from here, the computation is just the same as the computation was in uh, question A. So we get the number 7 as a result. So in both of these examples, example 1 and example 2, the result of doing a limit the number that we got that's the result of the limit was the same as the number that we got from uh, finding the y value on the, uh, of the function. Now we know from previous videos that the limit is not the same idea as the y value. They're different uh, concepts, but in some uh, situations the value of the limit turns out to be the same as the value of the y value. All right, let's do example three. Uh, example three involves this uh, function f of x that's what's called a rational function. Uh, remember, a rational function means that the function is a ratio of polynomials. Also notice that the function is given in two different forms. Uh, the form on the left I would call the, uh, the standard form. And the form on the right I would call the factored form. All right, well, uh, question A, we're supposed to find f parentheses 1. Um, in general, I'll make a note that the factored form is the more useful form, even though the standard form is probably the more familiar form for you. The factored form is the form that's usually the most convenient for substituting in particular x values and computing y values. So let's do that computation. So the result is that f of 1 equals 0. When x equals 1, the y value equals 0. All right, now let's find the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. So I'll take the same approach as before. I'll start by writing down the expression that I've been asked to compute, and then I'll write an equal sign, and I'll write the exact same expression except with the formula uh, put in for f of x.
All right, now, where do we go from here? We have to take the limit of this expression. Let's go back up and, well, first of all, uh, notice again that this function is a rational function. It's a ratio of polynomials. And let's go back up and see what our, our limit properties tell us about rational functions. Uh, a useful property is, is theorem 3, part 2. It says if you have a rational function, and if you substitute in x equals c and it does not cause the denominator to be zero, then you can compute the limit of the rational function by just simply substituting in x equals c. So that could be paraphrased. If nothing goes wrong when you just substitute in the x value, then you can compute the limit by substituting in the x value. So that's theorem 3 um, applied here. So let's show how that would look. According to theorem 3, uh, so let's write down that we have a rational function. And the, the pertinent point that when you substitute in x equals 1, it does not cause the denominator to be 0. You could say that more concisely by saying that we have a rational function with x equals 1 in the domain. So theorem 3 says that we can just substitute in x equals 1. When I do that, uh, the result looks like this. Now, that's the exact same expression that we had up here. So we know how this is going to end. We're just going to get the number 0 as a result. So I can just uh, skip to that punchline. So here we have yet another example where computing the limit ended up giving the same number as computing the y value. But again, I have to stress that's not always the case. The limit is a different idea from the, from, from the idea of the y value. All right, well, let's go on. Um, this example actually has a part C and D. In part C, we're supposed to find f of 3. So there's our uh, formula for f of x up, up here. And we're supposed to compute f of 3. Well, just as when we computed f of 1, I'm going to use the factored form. So we see that the y value does not exist, because you cannot divide by 0. Now, uh, how do we find the limit? So will we start by the same approach we uh, took before. We write down the expression we're supposed to compute, and we then re write the expression again, but we replace the function symbol with the function formula. Now, what do we do here? If you go back up and look at our properties of limits, we have this theorem 4. Let's look at that carefully. It says that if you have a function whose limit is some number that's not 0 and some function whose limit is 0, then if you stack those functions up and take the limit, the resulting limit does not exist. Before I'm not going to say that again. Let's go down and look at this function and let's, uh, let me talk about what I just talked about, but in the context of this function. So I'm going to say here, Notice that the limit of the numerator is not 0. Notice that the limit of the denominator is 0. So we have uh, a function that's the numerator, and its limit is not 0. And we have another function that's the denominator. Its limit is 0. So the limit of the numerator is 0. I'm mean, sorry, is, the limit of the numerator is not 0. The limit of the denominator is 0. So now let's go back up and look at our limit properties again. By theorem 4, if I stack those 
two functions, the numerator and the denominator, up, then the limit of that resulting ratio does not exist. So let's write that summary here. So this is a little subtle. Notice that I used theorem 3 to figure out what the limit of the numerator was. The limit of the numerator was the number negative 4, and that's not 0. And I used theorem 3 again when I computed the limit of the denominator. The limit of the denominator is the number 0. But when I computed the limit of the ratio, I didn't use theorem 3 for that. Computing the limit of the ratio involved theorem 4. Theorem 4 tells us that the limit of the ratio does not exist. That's the end of this video. Thank you.